it because sometimes what you find really will change a story or it will tell you that couldn't have happened or, you know, it can't be that way. It, it has to be this other way, which also has this ripple effect. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is my very good friend, Lisa C. And we're going to be talking about Lady Tan's Circle of Women, her 10th novel. I can't believe this. Years ago, I read Lisa's book, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, and her writing completely captivated me. Yes, who did not run out and look up Bound Feet on the internet as soon as you read that book? Come on, you know you did. So now Lisa is best, back with her best book. I think it's besting even Snowflower. Yes, folks, I'm going out on the line and saying that right now. The book reporter bets on selection, and it's already garnered so much praise. Here's what our reviewer had to say about it. Lisa C. never disappoints. In the footsteps of her other great novels, Lady Tan's Circle of Research, Re <laughs> Lady Tan's Circle of Women, sorry about that, is a dazzling mix of historical research, fleshed out female friendships, realistic portrayals of familial bonds, and the ultimate heroine story. An individual struggle to become what they were intended for. Rich in tradition and the nuances of ancient medicine, Lady Tan's Circle of Women is a tribute to women supporting women and following one's own heart. Needless to say, C did not disappoint. So with that, oh. welcome Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. That was so lovely to hear. I love that. Thank you. And thank you for having me, Carol. It's always wonderful to see you. And, you know, we really are friends. So it's it's really fun to be here. Yes, we're not sitting poolside, though. We're, we're, we're no, just, we're not w. <laughs> We missed that. We totally missed that. So you have a wonderful story about how you came to discover Lady Tan. Can you share that with us? Because this is like absolutely wonderful, a kind of kismet kind of a thing. Yeah, you know, so I do think about books for a really long time before I decide this is the one. You know, with um, Island of Sea Women, it was about eight years. With T Girl of Hummingbird Lane, it was 20. So, you know, I do think about them for a long time. And I thought I knew what the next book was going to be. I was quietly doing research, gathering material, and then the pandemic hit. And the thing about that particular project was it was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into the interior of China. And obviously I could not go in 2020, 2021, 2022. I mean, even now I would be pretty hesitant about going somewhere so truly, truly remote. So anyway, that was that. And there we were, you know, in the pandemic. And I, I was at home, you know, like everyone else. I was feeling a little bit like, oh, I'm, forgive me for being so melodramatic, but like my life is over. I can't go, go places, you know, I can't go to China to do research. I can't go to a library or an archive. Everything was closed. Yeah. And so I really was kind of sitting around the house, you know, just at loose ends. One thing we all learned is that very few of us are essential. You know, we're not really essential. A writer is not an essential worker, it turns out. So um, yeah, very much at loose ends. And I don't know, I bought my first pair of pajamas. I bought my second pair of pajamas. Anyway, months went by. And there was a day when I was just walking by the bookshelves in my office. And I know you have a ton of books. I also have just a ton of books. And, and this one wall is just all my research books. And I don't know why, but the spine of one of them kind of popped out at me. Light gray with darker gray lettering. Why? I don't know, but I pulled it down. Pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I looked, I had that book on my shelf for 10 years and had never opened it. But I thought, you know, here we are in a pandemic. I have nothing to do. My life is over. Might as well start reading it now. And I did. And I got to page 19 when there was a mention of Tan Yan Shun, who, a, a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty, who when she turned 50 in 1511, published a book of her cases. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I put the book down. I went to the internet to look her up. And it turned out that her book was in print, not just in Chinese, but it was available in English. And I ordered it right then, got it the next day. And so instead of thinking about this book for five, 10, 20 years, it was all of about 26 hours. 
and this is what I'm going to do from there. And, you know, most of your writing time during COVID, you still weren't usually, you know, couldn't do your boots on the ground, go into the libraries or whatever. So still you've got this book, you've got this other book, and then you need to reach out. And I know the end of your book has so many resources you went to. How did you end up doing those during COVID days? Well, I think this is where a little bit of luck, serendipity, destiny, you know, kind of came into it. Um, I just started reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. The first person I looked for was the person who had translated the book into in, the original book into English. Out of all the places she could live in the world, she lived about 10 minutes from me. <laughs> How could that even be? But of course, this was, you know, pre-vaccines and all of that. So we would meet on Zoom and she introduced introduced me to many scholars. Um, she would, you know, send me an email and say, oh, you've got to watch this lecture that's going to happen in Singapore tonight. And I, you know, would watch it that, because it would pertain to the subjects that I was writing about. But I also just reached out to other scholars and professors literally around the world. And what's interesting is I, I think they may have been a little bit in the same boat that I was in, you know, isolated, didn't have anyone to talk to and so when I came along and, and you know would write and say can you tell me something about how mail worked in the Ming dynasty or how did you mail a letter in the Ming dynasty or uh, how long did it take to travel on the Grand Canal from Wuxi to Beijing what's the difference I mean some of this stuff was so semantic in a, in a weird way but you know I like to get it right so Tanya and Shen in real life her father worked for what was called the Board of Punishments. Mm -hmm. Her grandfather did, her great-grandfather, her uncle, and her husband. So it's Board of Punishments, but sometimes you see it as Board of Justice, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Punishments. And so I did have this long sort of back and forth with a professor at Harvard about which term should I use and why. You know, and wow. this is a tiny, tiny thing. Yeah. But again, I do have a feeling that they were just as grateful to talk to me as I was to them. So what made her decide to um, translate this book into English? All those, like, when did she do that? The first person that you spoke with. Right. So she does translate a lot of med Chinese medical texts into English so that they can be used mostly in um, traditional Chinese medicine colleges around the country, and even, you know, English speaking, uh, traditional Chinese medicine colleges around the world. So this is just one of many books that she has translated from Chinese. Wow. So just sit there and find the right person to be talking to. Right. And then yeah. it's like, okay, here, we've got this person, and then she's introducing, you know, I agree, People didn't have a lot of time to, things to do during COVID. And wait, I've got this expertise, and here's somebody who wants to know some answers. I don't have to go to class today. I've got time. I can sit down and chat with her. You know? It's another fun thing that I did. And I just want to take a moment to digress and say, please forgive my really sad background. I'm in a hotel in San Diego. <laughs> and I managed to kind of rig myself in a, in a little corner where there was a little bit of natural light, <laughs> barely natural light. <laughs> anyway, um, what was, what was, what were we just saying? I lost my train of thought. Oh there. dear. Okay, wait a second. Where were we? Um, let's just go on. How's that? A second. Just that they, that, you know, that people really. Oh, I know what it was. Was that you know scholars? They they really deal purely in facts. You know, and what what has the research shown? And I would ask questions like, How do you think Han Yanshan met the tile maker? So one of so most of her cases are the women and girls in the family compound that she lives where she lives with her husband and you know his hundred of his relatives plus their servants. So you know these are elite women and girls plus the people who take care of them. But there are some other cases in there that are just you know like how did she meet these people? The woman who holds a tiller on a ship, another woman who's a brick and tile maker. Mm -hmm. Well, Tang and Shen, you know, this is a time when Confucian rules uh, really informed and constricted what a woman could do. You know, he did not have a lot of 
love and respect for women. I think it's fair to say she has all of these sayings like an educated woman is a worthless woman. A good woman should never take more than three steps from her front gate. So Tanya Shen, she was an elite woman, highly educated, a wife, a mother, eventually a grandmother. So she did follow all of those rules. And yet she had a what we would call a career, right? <laughs> Right. And, and so she was sort of circumventing what was allowed. Mm -hmm. And nobody really knows how she met these other people, mm -hmm. you know, these other, the, the tile maker, the, the, the tiller woman. But I would ask, you know, these scholars, like, if you thought about it, what, you know, what, what, what does your imagination tell you? I have to tell you, their imaginations don't go that far. They're pretty lacking. Huh? It was like there they're are no creative bedtime that. Yeah, <laughs> because there's you know, and and rightly so, they yeah. have to stick really with what's been documented, not imagining yeah. how something came to be. Yeah. So the, okay, so you also wrote the book in the first person. Was that something you were going to know you were going to do right from the beginning? So it's a funny thing. I think almost all of my, except for the mysteries, all of my novels have been written in the first person. I've been told by various editors that this is really the most difficult um, form to write to be in the first person. But to me, it feels the most natural. And it's a way for me to really be in my character's clothes, you know, to really be living her story with her and so it it helps me to tell to tell a story that way of course there are problems with it um she she happens to be a very reliable narrator but often you know a character you can't really trust exactly everything she says you know this is true in shanghai girls for example also in um snowflower and the secret fan that there are things if you're the one telling the story just as it is in real life, there are things we leave out, there are things we may kind of hedge around. Mm -hmm. Tanya Chen is, I think, very straightforward in her telling of, of her life story. Um, so she, I, I will say, she is very reliable. But um, again, it's just a way for me to really inhabit that character. Right. And it really helps me to connect not just to you know, what's going on around her, which let's be frank, this is 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's a very different time period to write about than let's say 100 years ago in the 1920s. I mean, we, I think most of us are pretty familiar with what, with, we may not have been alive then, but we're pretty familiar with what that life was like in the roaring 20s. I mean, we've all read The Great Gatsby. We've seen plenty of movies that take place in that time. You could even say the same for American pioneer days, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the Wild West or El Elizabethan England, because we have so much that we've read and seen about those times, right. uh, but we don't about the Ming dynasty. And, mm -hmm. and it's so long ago. So they're just very basic things of how did stuff work? How did people get from place to place? What did they wear? What was their makeup like? What kind of ornaments did they wear in their hair? So if I can be in her shoe, in Tanya and Shen's shoes, mm -hmm. that allows me, that really allowed me to follow her through a day, for example. So, you know, the part three, yeah, so part, yeah part three starts with that whole, it's a long chapter of just following her from the moment she gets up until the end of the day and all of the things she has to do, but also how she does it. Uh, to me, it reminds me a little bit of like the Laurel Ingalls Wilder stories, right? That you're you're sort of in it and you learn how to churn butter and, and you learn <laughs> how they, you know, how they just dealt with pioneer life. Like they whisk that broom an awful lot of times, whisk, 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 that and then something happened and they didn't have the broom. Yeah, all those stories. So are you researching as you're going along as well? Like if you get to a section. And you have to write about what her makeup is like or whatever. Do you write XXX and keep on going? Or do you stop and do the research at that point? Or do you know where you're going before you get to a chapter? Well, when I start writing, I think I've gathered everything. Okay. But 
I definitely haven't. <laughs> you know, so then when I hit those spots, I I do stop and do the research right then. You know, and and uh, to me, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I could do an XXX and go back, um, it, because sometimes what you find really will change a story, or it will tell you that couldn't have happened, or you know, it can't be that way. It it has to be this other way, which also has this ripple effect. Right, right. Ramifications so, later in the story. Yeah. Right. So um, I don't know. A good example of that actually was with China dolls. Mm -hmm. So in that very first chapter, here are these three young women are going to audition for a, a nightclub act. And they're, um, they've come in off the street and they're in the ladies room in this nightclub and they're changing out of their street clothes into their little homemade tap outfits. I mean, this is like page 15. I, I thought I had done all the research and all of a sudden I had a thought of, hmm, what are they wearing under there? It's 1937. Women didn't have panties like we think of them today. And the bra had barely been invented. I mean, just barely invented. And most people just made them out of their old lace curtains. You know, so, so what were they wearing under there? And I just went right down the rabbit hole for about 40 hours what? doing research on the history of women's underwear. This is after I thought, you know, I am ready to go. And then I hit page 15. Yeah. Page 15. It's like, oh, this can take a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you know, I love the titles of the four parts of the book, the milk days, hair pinning days, rice and salt days, and sitting quietly. As you were writing, did you see a natural way to break up the story like this? These are the four phases of women's lives. Well, I, I yes. I mean, it, I actually use those four sections in Snowflower and the Secret Fan as well. I mean, that this is 20 some years between these two books. So I hope people don't mind and don't think, oh, she's, you know, retreading territory or something. But um, I, I think there are natural divisions in a woman's life. And, you know, there is this time when we're little kids mm -hmm. and then there, we sort of enter a period where you're going, you're blossoming, you know, you start to wear different types of clothes. You're, you're entering the world in mm -hmm. a sense. And right. you know, hair pinning, hair pinning days really referred to um, that a girl hair was changed and this was um, her hairstyle signified to other people that she was marriageable and while today people not be might not be thinking oh I want to get married necessarily you know they might be thinking about other things you are sort of out and about in a more maybe flirtatious way mm -hmm. uh, or when you were a little kid mm -hmm. okay, and then it. and again not everybody gets married but um, those days when you have a family, when you're taking care of children, when you're managing a household, and even if you aren't married and don't have kids, you still have your household, you still have your job, you still have all that day to day, uh, all your chores, all the things that you have to do. And I think that's, you know, something we experience today, and, and as well as whatever, 500,000 uh, years ago. <laughs> that last part at least in Chinese tradition, really referred to once a woman hit menopause. And people, of course, didn't live very long. So often these were widows. So that the idea of sitting quietly was like you were sitting quietly until you joined your husband in death. Right. But what we know from what we can see around us today, that that period of what, you know, so-called sitting quietly of menopause of this incredible change is not a time when women sit quietly. It's not a time when they retract. This mm -hmm. is a time of great creativity, great activity, creativity, activity, being out in the world, doing all kinds of things. And it, there's a certain freedom yeah. that I think, you know, after you hit 50. And this was, this definitely happened to Tanya and Shen, who, because she was a doctor, her whole, you know, um, it was said about her after, after that book was, her original book was published when she was 51, that her cures became even more magical, mm -hmm. that her abilities at diagnosis 
were, were like, um, you know, the great medical masters who could look at someone and actually see through their body to bodies to see what was wrong. So I think she was, you know, pretty, pretty active in those days and far from sitting quietly. And she lived till how old? How many years old was she? 96. Wow. Which six even today is incredible, right? Yes. yes. You get to 96. But to have done that in the 1500s, uh, really amazing. And of course, um, I think one of her grand, great nephews in one of the afterwards says, you know, and that may show that she was a pretty good doctor. <laughs> she knew how to doctor herself, you know, and it is true because where the different phases used to happen in your life, I always joke that women at 40 start being more honest. They don't always have the great boyfriend, the great husband. Not everything's perfect. Before right. that, you have to pretend everything's perfect. And then you get more honest as time goes on. And it's, oh, well, this isn't really not working out, but this is okay over here. And I think it's just a different time in people's lives. And then sitting quietly, I think happens, you're right, a lot later at this point. Because people are free of different things, but they still have so many freedoms of places they can go and things they can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think when your kids, you know, are either move out, you know, go off to college or move out. Um, I said to someone the other day that, you know, it's not a surprise to me now in hindsight that I wrote Snowflower after my younger son went to college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that this, you know, this was the breakthrough book for me. No, no question. But when your kids are at home, there's all, even when they're older, you know, there's always a part of you that's paying attention to yeah. what, where are they in the house? Do they need to eat? Are they doing their homework? Are they getting into trouble? Did they come home on time? You know, there's just always a little part of your mind that's over there. Right. And once, once Christopher went off to college, I, I really, uh, all of a sudden I had that part of my mind back. Yeah. It was like this freedom of, okay, I've done everything I can at this point. I'm sure he'll be back with questions, but I still have more time. Yeah. <laughs> many, many times, many times. You know, I love the line, no mud, no lotus. And it's a line that Tan and her uh, friend Mei Ling talk about as young girls. It means that goodness can grow from difficulties. Adversity can sprout from triumph into triumph. It's something that comes up again and again as a theme in the book. And let's talk about that phrase because I feel like I've heard it before. Did I hear it in Snowflower as well, or am I just no? Making but I think it is a you know a, um, from some other some Eastern philosophy that you know from, from um, no no mud no lotus the idea that it really is through adversity that wonderful things can happen and even though you may not realize I mean I think everybody watching this. Uh, has gone had this experience where you're going through something really tough, really hard, sometimes tragic, but that out of that, you know, in the moment you're you're just like in it, you're in that mud, but that later you don't even know what's going to happen and how that's all going to change and and actually often the very positive things that come out of adversity. Yeah. Well like the pandemic and finding all these people that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> Tan loses her mother very early in the book. And I kept thinking about how different it would have been if her mother had lived longer. And she would have been in a very different um, class of what she was supposed to do because she would have been in the home in a very different way or sent off to marry in a different way. So can we talk about that a little bit? Because her mother was very different from the person she became. Yes, her mother is just a very traditional wife of that time and very concerned with all the rules for women. And, the, you know, the opening scene is she's just drilling her daughter to, you know, with all of these rules that should be memorized of what's appropriate for a girl, what's appropriate for a woman, what's appropriate for a mother. And it doesn't give too much away to say that, you know, respectful lady dies by the end of chapter one. So she knows she's <laughs> not there for a long time. And that really does a couple of things. I mean, of course, it's very, it's very, I, I find that scene to be really sad. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, you know, my mom died not all that long ago. And I think I'm still very much dealing with that in my writing. Mm -hmm. And then what that loss means, you know, no matter how old you are. But that in a way, you know, and, and as a result, she sent off to live with her grandparents. Mm -hmm. 
but her father you know goes off to be an imperial scholar so she doesn't you know she's not going to see him for years and years and years so in a way she's she's orphaned mm-hmm. and i think that that sets her up to feeling like she's orphaned in many ways you know that she doesn't have a circle of women to care for her you know she doesn't have that mother who can envelop her. <clears throat> and so to me, so much of the story is really about how she, even without realizing it, how she's slowly creating a circle of women mm-hmm. and how they also very deliberately come to support her, even though she's kind of, well, you know, not, not aware and not um, understanding what they're doing for her. Right. Well, I mean, she leaves with her father's concubine. She leaves with, you know, her and she leaves with her servant girl, Poppy, who Mm -hmm. sleeps at the foot of her bed. But she realizes one day she doesn't know anything about Poppy. Like Poppy is just this this thing almost to her, like a a, 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 like a tool to get Mm -hmm. her through her day. And one day she wakes up and like, I don't even know anything about this woman who sleeps at my bedside or my bed foot every single evening. And like, I rely on Poppy for this. I rely on her for that. Poppy doesn't have bound feet. Poppy is this. And I just found it was so interesting because all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm with these women. It's the beginning of a circle in some ways because it's beginning, but it's with, you know, your your father's mistress and your servant. And that's who you're taking off with. So I thought it was really interesting to see. Yeah. uh, So, you know, that I think of there's like a circle this way, right? Of, of the women who are going to come around. But there's also in my mind, this other circle that kind of goes like this. And it's really looking at um, different classes of mm-hmm. women. Mm-hmm. So servants, concubines, wives, um, spinster aunts, uh, ladies and, you know, royal ladies in waiting all the way up to the empress. And that this is this kind of cycle in a way of, of where women are in, in the world and in society. And yet, no, you know, you could be the empress and you could be the lowest servant. Oh, and I left out working women like the tiller woman, like the like the ling, the med, midwife, like um the, the brick maker, you know, people who are out in the world working completely different than an elite woman or any of, you know, or even a servant who's really confined, owned, basically. Um, so w- what I really was thinking about is that it doesn't matter where you are, you know, on that spectrum, let's say, or where you are in the world or what time period that we all women are connected um, in some way by our physiology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you are born in this type of body, you are at some point going to get your period. You um, may or may not get pregnant, but you know, if you do get pregnant, you will, will, that baby's going to have to come out somehow. (laughs) The child and, gate will be open. <laughs> you know, at some point you're, you know, menopause is coming. Right. And it just doesn't matter who, you know, it doesn't matter again where you are in the world, when you lived in the world, that this is something that unites us. Right. And it's a shared experience, even though our daily lives can be completely different. And but you know, when it comes down to it, the Empress still has to get that baby out just yeah. the same way as as the you know a, a village woman in her hut mm-hmm. and i found that was interesting it's like the one common thing with women is this is going to happen this is going to happen this may or may not this is right. going to happen and i think that yeah you're just sitting there saying no matter whether you're elite or the poorest of the poor something is going to happen you know the same things to you now we have to talk about the marriage bed and i know you have a photo of this on your website and i know you saw and played in one in real life when you were younger so tell us about this because i'm fascinated by this thing with rooms on it i'm fascinated by what it would look like yeah so again you know i could, there were a lot of thing places i couldn't go and a lot of things i couldn't do but i have been writing about china for a very long time and so I've been to China many times and I felt very comfortable about writing about Wuxi. I've been in many, many Chinese gardens, many traditional Chinese houses. But this, I think, may be the first time in one of my books that there was actual, an actual physical object. And that one is the marriage bed. So my 
family has been in the Chinese antiques business for you know well over a hundred years. My great great grandfather uh, started the business. My great grandfather continued it, and it and it's still in existence today. And um, this marriage bed, it's been in the family. I mean, in the family store for as long as I can remember. But I would say for well over a hundred years. And so it's it, so if you can think of a, a Chinese, a big, you know, mansion um, where you have these really big rooms, mm -hmm. but no real sense of privacy, you know, again, you have servants and all these people. And so they would build these marriage beds that were almost like a room within a room. Mm -hmm. You could take them apart, you know, and put, fold them up, move them. But this one, um, it elaborately carved. Uh, you for it has a big um, wooden canopy and carved wooden tassels that hang down. You step into the first room, and this is where the servant would sleep. Um, and then the next room was a dressing room, and finally through a moon gate, carved moon gate into the sleeping platform. And this particular one on all sides of the sleeping platform were paintings on silk that depicted, oh, you know, like romantic married life, uh, a couple sitting, you know, walking by the stream or she's playing an instrument and he's writing poetry, these really lovely scenes. This was like my playhouse when I was a little girl. I love it. My cousins, my little boys played in there. You know, when I have lots of grandchildren, I hope they get to play in there too. And so it was really a magical place for me as a child and still is. But I, I when I thought about this time period in the Ming Dynasty and how, how again, how separated from the world women were, okay. and this was you know, respectful lady's bed, it's where she dies. And then when Han Yanshan is, you know, moves to her grandparents' house and is shown into her new room, that bed has been reconstructed for her. And so she can, you know, touch where her mother touched. And there is a secret compartment. In real life, there wasn't a secret compartment. I made that up. Mm -hmm. But um, this also then becomes a play house in a sense for uh, Tan, for Tan Yan Chun and her friend Mei Ling. Yeah. And Mei Ling, again, the daughter of a midwife, very different class, you know, very different circumstances. The first time she's there, she says something like, you know, this is bigger than my house where <laughs> I live with my mother. And and Yan Chun thinks, oh, she's just teasing me, but I'm not so sure. Yeah. I'm not so sure that this is what was going on. You know, she's also saddened when she's married out to a merchant family, not an official one. So what are the differences? Somebody's going to be um, just a merchant and the others were more prestigious to be an official family? Yes, that's exactly right. And again, this sort of goes back to Confucius, who set out these, these um, levels of... of um, occupation and you know what was esteemed and what wasn't so like the very very bottom butchers uh coroners midwives people who got their hands in blood mm -hmm. and then as you work your way up you know you would have farmers and things like that but but merchants were seen as not terribly useful to society that they were just making money okay then at the very top, you had the imperial scholars. And these were people who study for a lifetime, you know, sometimes have to take the imperial exam over and over and over again. But if they pass, they are awarded different positions throughout the empire. And uh, Yan Shen, her in, again, in real life, she came from generations of imperial scholars. And her father and her grandfather in particular, her grandfather in particular was way, you know, a very high ranking official and had been given all kinds of accolades and land and, and you know, all of this stuff that um, really showed the, just the level that they mm -hmm. were in, in yes. society. And although her husband's family is much more wealthy, they're still just merchants. Mm -hmm. And so she sees that as not so great. And yeah. her husband is studying for the imperial exams. And, you know, of course, she hopes for the best for him. 
Yes, and her parents, by that connection of the marriage, are his family is hoping that even though they have more money, her father can help him oh, yes. in his studies for his exams. That there is right, a, and then a, if a, he a passes, point. then her father will be able to help get him into a good position, and you know the, all of that. So it's it's it it, it uh, to me, you know, there's an aspect there where it's like the um, sort of European arranged marriages mm -hmm. in, you know, where you're trying to solidify land, you're trying to solidify power, you're trying to solidify position. And so this was the same, same kind of thing. Yeah, same kind of thing, this is what they're gonna do. But the, no matter which class you're in, there are apologies for not having sons. And as you and I both have sons, just think that we're apologizing, we'd be doing to the family. And that's persisted even into recent years. Have yes. women these days heard and earned any more respect in China? Is there any more going on these days or is it still? Absolutely. You know, here's, here's something that's, I mean, there's so many facets to that. But one is that when Mao took power in 1949, and I am never going to be an apologist for him in any way, he was responsible for millions and millions of death, deaths and you know unbelievable misery for millions of people. However, that said, he was the first person to say women hold up half the sky. Mm -hmm. He meant it. And that meant that women, you know, after 1949 had to come out of seclusion and join life. And so that meant for some working in the fields, working in factories, going to school, becoming doctors, becoming dentists, and entering politics. And so China in many ways was way ahead of the West in terms of equal rights uh, and equal opportunities for women. Of course, China is the same, same there as it is here, not equal pay for equal work, but you know, they, were, they were ahead of us right. uh, in that regard. But this desire for a son still remains. Um, this was some, you know, a side effect of the one child policy was that if you were only going to have one child, you needed to have a son. Mm -hmm. And so that did result of the 30 years that the one child policy existed, that there were a million fewer girls born each year um, through selective abortion. Wow. So mm -hmm. you know, why is that? And this really goes to this very old um belief and tradition that has to do with the afterlife, right? Yes. So um, in that traditional version of the afterlife, it's kind of like a parallel life to this one where you have all the same needs, wants, and desires that we have right now. You have to have clothes, you have to have food, you have to have a place to live. Um, these days you need to have a flat screen TV, um, a nice iPhone, a, a laptop, you know, all of the things that we need here, you need there. And so throughout the year, and of course this is, we just have to stop and say, you know, people practice religion and traditions very differently. Mm -hmm. Take something like Christmas and some people, they just like to put up a tree. Sometimes they just, you know, buy every present in the world and go into debt. Some people, it's the most religious holiday. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a whole spectrum of how we celebrate different holidays. And it, it's the same for um, Chinese and, and whether they're in China or elsewhere. So, you know, the most, uh, the most prominent of these holidays is Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, but there are other ones throughout the year where you, one of the aspects of Chinese New Year is that you make offerings to your ancestors and um, you, you can make them yourself. You can buy them oranges and apples and things like that, but you could also make or buy um, like a house made out of paper mache or a flat screen TV made out of paper mache. And then these things are burned and they travel to the afterworld mm -hmm. for your ancestors. And as a thank you, they take care of you through the rest of the year. And they, they make sure you have a good job and that you're making money and that you have good health and that you fall in love. But here's the catch. Only one person can make those offerings and that's the eldest son. Oh, okay, okay. So that is the reason there has to be the eldest son. Well, there has to be a son. 
Yes, there has to be a son. And so in many families, you know, let's pretend I had five daughters and you had five sons. You might let me adopt, not yeah. truly, but sort of adopt one of your not, you know, one of your lower down sons to be my son who would be able to um, do do all of the traditions uh, for after I died. So it's like the concubine's son, because she had born a son. Um, what's her name? The mother was then, I can't remember what we call her. Um, it's a blessed mother, but it's, oh, I can't remember her name. But anyway, she would be <laughs> as, as, as result, protected. She would be respected mother. Respected, respected mother would be protected just because the concubine had had the um, son with her husband. Okay. Right. And, and the, the wife had not. Right. And that's the reason new people were brought into relationships was just for the opportunity to maybe have sons for the family. Right. Interesting. And because men like to have younger women around too. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Let's get real on that too. Okay. You know, <laughs> I, I did this event down here in San Diego yesterday and I was seated next to a woman. It, it, it was a lunch and she had already read the book and she said, you know, just look around you in this room. There are a lot of those younger wives. <laughs> <laughs> I, was looking, I was like oh yeah she's right oh yeah Look at all these you know women that around. hasn't changed too much through time <laughs> no no you no it's lucky we haven't been turned in for the younger models yet <laughs> yeah 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 well you know it's funny I was watching that documentary about Mary Tyler Moore the other day and I realized that her last husband was 18 years younger than she was wow. and when she passed away I think it was at 80 you think he was only 62 and that's a huge age gap when you sit and think about it now Yes. If we had people that were that much older than us or, you know, as husbands or spouses, it'd be very mm -hmm. interesting. That was, that's my contribution to age for today. <laughs> the Mary Tyler Moore documentary. Well, midwife, she, who is Mei Ling's mother has such pressure on her. There are complications at a birth. She's blamed. If there's um, something, it's like malpractice as of today. If things go well, it's assumed that she would have done things well and assumed that she would have done well. And there are other roles that she has that make her less well-regarded. Was she someone that was esteemed still among large-footed large women for her role, for what she did as a midwife? Yeah, so you know, doctors couldn't couldn't be present for a birth. They you know, couldn't get their hands in blood. And yet you know, babies have to come out and somebody has to catch them and somebody has to help when there's a problem. And, uh, you know, midwives had an incredibly important role, not just in China, but around the world. You know, in this country, it's only about a hundred years ago that women started having babies in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this real transition from um, midwife, you know, women delivering at home with the help of a midwife to male doctors delivering uh, in a hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not that long ago. Mm -mm. So to me, the the idea that that here's a person who's less than, who's at the bottom rung of society, and yet also a true necessity if culture and society is going to continue because you have to have people who can help get the babies out. Right? <laughs> You're not going to have those sons at all unless you can help someone who help, can help get them out. Right. Midwives at that time, I mean, obviously there were all kinds of levels. There were the ones who just worked in a vi village. There were the people who were sent to the capital to help uh, the, the empress and other women in the palace. Mm -hmm. And those women, if it, it was a successful delivery, they could be rewarded for life. And so, you know, a doctor like Tanya and Shun, um, monetary rewards were not really in, in her future, especially mm -hmm. because her patients were mostly the women and girls in her household. Mm -hmm. And but also for just doctors in general, that this was not a big money-making proposition. But a, mid, a midwife in the right place at the right time with the right family with a successful birth could be rewarded with land, money, even a title. Hmm. And so it was this really, you know, even though kind of dirty and messy and icky and at the bottom of society, they actually had this opportunity to really be elevated hmm. um, through monetary gain. 
there was one part where I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but something happens on the baby's foot as the baby's being born. And I found out later on that that was not true, but it was such a great line. But it, but really it was, was true. It just didn't happen to the this character. I mean, it, it did happen in real life. Yeah. There are, and I don't think I'm giving too much away to say that there are certain things in this book that are, we'll just call them a little cringy, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they they may not have happened to Tan Yun Shan or her patients. But in the research I did, I did, I found these stories yeah. uh, of other women, uh, of things that had happened to them. So one would be the, the message on the baby's foot. Another would be the worm. That's, we'll just leave it there. And yeah, 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 yeah. I, I guess would be what happens in the capital when the Empress, you know, when, when, what we'll just say, well, I don't think it gives too much away. The Empress gives birth. And that that story is also a true, it is a true story based on a true story that actually happened. Yeah. But you're just sitting there saying, okay, these are really interesting times because she's going to come in and figure out what's wrong with the worm. Like she's going to figure out what's happening yet. It's been going on for so long. And then all of a sudden figures out, Oh, this is what happens. Right. There's such great scenes. There's one was great scene after the other in the book where you're sitting there saying, wow, that is really like fun. It's, you know, it's, it's not just, it's not just a good story. It's fun reading as well. So woven in also speaking of fun is a mystery, which makes the reading even more compelling now you've written mysteries in the past. Was this something you wanted to dive into as a plot device or did it come naturally into the story of how can I do this and play with this? So I really started to think a little bit about uh, a lot about yin and yang. And so yin, it's, it, you know, on one hand, um, dark, yang, light, female, male, uh, dirty, earthy, soiled, you know, clean, beautiful, heavenly. So all the negative things about women, all the positive things about men. And then also related to this uh, in my mind was the fact that Tan Yan Chen's, you know, father, grandfather, great grandfather, uncle, and her husband all worked for this um, department of punishments, mm -hmm. which is sort of like, you know, it's like the, they, they try you, they sentence you, and then you're sent off to be whipped or have your head cut off or, you know, whatever, whatever those punishments are. How completely opposite that is from what a doctor does, you know, from what a healing woman is doing. And so to me, that also fit into this idea of yin and yang, this dark and this light, you know, life and death bringing life into the world and punishing people. And so it was while I was looking at that, that I found a, another book called The Washing Away of Wrongs, which is believed to be the first book of forensics written anywhere in the world. It came out in 1247. So really a long time ago and was used in China until just a few years ago. This book is so amazing about, you know, how to tell if someone has drowned and why and was it on purpose? What, you know, was it an accident? It was someone, um, did someone kill, you know, kill themselves by hanging or what is this some setup and why? How can you tell? And all, you know, if you use this poison, what will it look like? And, and I swear, I mean, I used to love the CSI shows. Yes. <laughs> we have more CSI shows out of this one book. It could fill the, you know, a hundred episodes. It was so amazing. But but it really grew out of that idea of, of yin and yang, of dark and light, of life and death. And to me, those, you know, to have her book on the one hand, it's all about um, health and 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 um, healing and on the other how you look at death how you diagnose death and and how you also send people off and you know into their graves right right and you think one thing happens and something else happens it was it was really really fun because it's like wait a second this story's taking a whole different tone over here wait this is really fun let's see what's going to happen and and we have all these detectives on it you know and how are we going to figure this out Loved it. There, you know, there are a lot of parallels between the way women's bodies were viewed in the 15th century and today. Decisions made by men, men making decisions. Were you thinking about that? Because a lot changed as you were writing this book. You know, it's and all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, what's going on again? 
Yeah, I mean, I I was I think I was done with writing the book and was just in the editing process when the Dobbs de decision came down. So you know, it was not in the the, the fact that that was going to happen was not something I could have anticipated. But what I have been thinking about is that the, just what you were saying, this question of who has control over women's bodies, mm -hmm. and that this is something that they were talking, you know, she was talking about 500 years ago. She was helping women who wanted to get pregnant, who didn't want to get pregnant, wanted to end a pregnancy. There's a case she has of that's, you know, it's like case number 28 where she's helping someone who's had a botched abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, this, this is not something new, right? No. And, and uh, there's a, a Catholic nun in the 1100s, Hildegard von Bingen, who also wrote a couple of books where she had outlined all of these herbs and recipes to help women, you know, get pregnant, uh, how, how to nurse, you know, how to help the milk come in, but also how to end an unwanted pregnancy. A Catholic nun, not, right. 100 years ago. So uh, I, th I really think that this conversation or this debate it was probably going on in caveman days yeah right yeah. who has control over women's bodies and their reproduction mm -hmm. it's still going on right now today mm -hmm. and i suspect that when we're all living on mars they're you know yeah still going to be having that can't be martian if you have the baby you can't be martian if you didn't have the baby right. can you be pregnant when you're an astronaut i mean just think about all these things you know it's like, can you get pregnant after in space? I mean, okay, like, here we go. You know, husband and wife cannot go in space together. So did you go right, but the chapter titles are so terrific. Do you go back and do those later on or are those done as you go? Uh, I think they come later because I, you know, I, I'll, well, it, it, both, both ways. Because yeah. sometimes the chapter titles are based on a, on an aphorism. Mm -hmm. I know that going into that chapter that, that, that's a whatever that aphorism is about. That's sort of the theme that I want to be writing about. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of gives a heads up to the reader. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I don't have that. And, you know, I'll write the whole chapter and then only later, maybe months later, we'll be editing it and say, oh, here's a here's a pretty little phrase I can use. So we'll, we'll just take that one and dash that back over there. Yeah. I mean, I think the people realize, and I think our readers have really realized how complex it is, the writing of a book. It's the research, it's the writing, it's going back and still looking for facts. And then it's making sure the story flows. And the one thing that's so beautiful about this book is it really has this flow to it. It's not a short book, but is it is a very satisfying read that you're diving into and you want to stay with. And I just found that I, there are a lot of different herbs I want to have around my house now, because if this is going to cure this and this is going to cure that, it was very interesting to see the whole um, growing side of that, besides the technical side of how you use it and how you can procure these and where you would go get them and things like that. That was really interesting as well. Like where would you get what you needed and was there a lack of it at any point, which we often you know, ran into the last couple of years. Well, I wouldn't suggest, Carol, that you start stocking up on herbs randomly. <laughs> No, 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 no. But, no. but you know, traditional Chinese medicine, the practice of it has grown so much in this country mm -hmm. yes. that there are many places you can go to get good advice for what you, you know, what would be good for you and what are the good products for you. Um, so I would suggest that first, but, you know, this is a tradition that's 2000 years old. Mm -hmm. And while I, I don't think that you would, I mean, I think many people turn to traditional Chinese medicine as an adjunct yes. to Western medicine. So often, um, you know, people who are going through chemotherapy will try uh, Chinese herbs or um, acupuncture in particular to help with nausea and other side effects from radiation and chemo. Mm -hmm. So th these things can really work together. And, you know, so many of our drugs are now have have been made, you know, sort of synthesizing these traditional herbs, whether they're from China or from other parts of the country. You know, I think particularly of the Amazon and how many um, drugs have have come out of these natural products in the Amazon.
that's what it's like. My local gardening store is still doing basil, thyme, and things like that. So I think I'm really I'm okay with my herbs for the moment. You know, um, was Lady Tan Circle of Women always the title? Did you always know that? What you or did you play no, around? This, this was a very hard title. I think we went through about twenty different iterations. Wow. It was really hard to. Um, it, 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 it kept being too literal. I mean, even now in my computer, it's Doctor of Woman, <laughs> Women. Okay. okay. Of Women. That's not a great title, but that's how it is in my computer. Right. Uh, but finally, there was. It was a point when I, I we may have been all the way into copy editing. I mean, really far along in the process, and I was reading the manuscript for the you know ten thousandth time, and I saw this phrase. Uh, I think it's when Miss Chen, the the um, concubine, says to this uh, to Poppy, you know, we when they move to this to the grandparents house we have to be the ones who help her we have to be a circle around her and then it turned out that that idea kept popping up in the book mm -hmm. that I had written in in there but that I hadn't really realized it and this has happened to me many times actually where I, I feel like my subconscious is working and and is telling me something that I I, I it's so infused in the story but that it's not deliberate in the front of my brain but that it's so there that then once I spotted it it was like oh my gosh it's here throughout this is the perfect title yeah, it is it is the perfect title because so many times she's got the circle around her and we're it, people taking care of her people right. she's caring for other people and, um, the, and like many of us you know not realizing the care we're getting mm -hmm. not realizing mm -hmm. the support that we're getting and you know the people you can call at the moment mm -hmm. that you really need something. And it's not always the person who's right here. It's picking up the phone and saying, okay, I got to run this by you. What do you yes. think? You know, it's, that's your circle from there. You know, the book is dedicated to the memory of Marina Bokelman. And who was she? Because I was so interested to see, you know, right. you have so many things that she has done. So she was a friend first originally of my father's. They met, she was only 17, but she was already at UCLA. And my father was in graduate school in the anthropology department. She studied folklore. And she, over time, became one of my mother's closest friends. My dad eventually did totally break Marina's heart, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, she has been and was in my life from the time I was five. She was a folklorist. She drove around the country in the early 1960s collecting the music of blues musicians. This was before, you know, even in England, people were rock and rollers were picking up on the blues and, and sort of resurrecting our own tradition. She was collecting all of that. And it's now at UCLA uh, in their collection. She became a medicine woman, you know, and, and practiced throughout her entire life. I have to say, she, um, she wrote to me, I guess it's about a year ago, and she was 82. And she said, you know, I, I feel like I've lived long enough. And um, I'm going to stop eating. Wow. And she did. And she died. But, but in our last conversation, she's the one who told me, uh, you know, she was asking what I was working on. And, and um, she had heard of Han Yunshan, but she also was the one who told me about Hildegard von Bingen, that Catholic nun uh, who in the 1100s had written so much about uh, women's health and, and, you know, making all of how to make your own herbs to take care of yourself. Right. And I think she was just, she really was like a second mother to me. Right. And um, that la those last phone calls just meant so much. And we were so, I think, in tune with, again, you know, how women make choices about their lives. I didn't try to talk her out of anything and mm -hmm. her decision. And, and she had doctors and nurses taking care of her as she went through this pretty awful process, but it was really her choice. And I, I, just those last conversations, they, again, they meant so much to me, but they also tied so much to this book. Mm -hmm. that I just really felt that it should be dedicated to her memory. Yeah, I just like, well, sometimes we see those things and we're just like, who are those people? And I said, I've got to ask Lisa who this person is. 
I actually, I have in my office at home, a sampler that she made in the 1960s when we moved, first moved into our house in Topanga. And this house was a cookie house. And the previous owner had been a Viennese composer. <laughs> and he had written in, um, uh, he had this little thing on above his work table that was in, I guess, German that said, uh, the translation is work hard and don't get depressed. So every time I go into my office, I see that. And so I see her handiwork, but also this, this message of work hard and don't get depressed. Well, see, it really, really works because just think where you were when you first sat down and said, what am I going to write? Woe is me. You know, yeah. we go from there. <laughs> we go from there to this fabulous cover. Was this the first cover or were you playing around no, with it? No, 